So this morning, we're going to go back, and we're going to talk about John 5. Now, um, if you've been around New Hope at all, uh, you've probably heard the expression, messes to miracles. People have said that's in the DNA of New Hope. And I just want you to know where it came from. It came from a message given on March 17, 1996. Many years ago, it was the first service, the grand opening in our, in our, in our genitorium, now referred to as the Kids Zone. And it was given by our founding pastor, Pastor Dave Stanfest. And we even named our street Bethesda Court as a result of that message. And uh, we've had two original songs written by members of the congregation entitled Messes to Miracles. Numerous testimonies have been given about people sharing how their lives have changed from being messy to miracles. We've had baptisms. And this morning you're gonna get a, a new version of that message. So I'm sorry to keep repeating ourselves. After 26 years, you have to hear the same thing. But I did not go back and listen to the original message, even though I was here that day. So what you're looking at is a, maybe when Pastor Rick takes a familiar song and puts a new tune to it, some of you find that really jarring and others maybe enjoy it. But the other reason we're looking at Message to Miracles is today is because that's the, what Pastor Craig assigned me to speak on. And Pastor Craig is gone on his 25th year 25-year wedding anniversary this week. He's off celebrating, and he asked me to speak on messes to miracles today. So as a church, we have been focused since the very beginning on the disadvantaged, the hurting, the suffering, people who are lost or need restoration. But I want you to know this morning, this is not a New Hope promotional message or a focus of New Hope. It's a focus of Jesus. Jesus said in Mark 2.17, I came to minister to the sick, not to the healthy. So our first observation this morning about the pool of Bethesda, or as I like to say, Bethesda, is it's by the sheep court, right by the sheep gate. So this is where the sheep came in. And if you're a student of the scriptures at all, you know that Isaiah 53 says, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. And the pool of Bethesda, trying to sound like a sheep there, I don't know if it's working, but pool of Bethesda is where people went for grace and mercy. So listen to what Isaiah 53, 5 and 6 says about Jesus. It says, he's the healer. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Jesus. All we like sheep have gone astray. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So here you have this pool and this, this passage in Isaiah shows that Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God, but he's also the good shepherd where he's referred to. He's all God and he's all man. And he's the one that can bring us healing. Now the Bible tells us that a great number of disabled people came to the pool of Bethesda looking for healing. It calls out three in this parable. It says the blind came, the lame came, and the paralyzed came. They all wanted a miracle. They wanted miracle healing. Now I'm gonna give a caveat this morning about physical healing, just a brief detour and say um, that if you're in a physical situation where you need healing, I believe that God still does physical healings today supernaturally. I believe also provides healing through medical science, doctors and nurses and hospitals. And in other cases, he gives us the grace to endure physical problems. Look at the Apostle Paul. We know he had some kind of thorn in the flesh. It's uncertain what that was but many think it was a physical problem, maybe to do with his eyes. But Paul finally came to the realization, he says, your grace is sufficient for me in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, for your power is made perfect in weakness. So this morning, we, as we look at this healing, I just wanna say whether God gives a supernatural healing or whether God gives um, healing through medical doctors and medicine or whether God gives us the grace God is still doing that today. We had a wonderful example of that in our church. 
friend of mine who I got to know over the years, a man named Charlie Dodge, who was diagnosed with cancer. And he battled cancer for many years. And what Charlie told me with his own uh, voice was that cancer was God's gift to him. See, Charlie really learned the secret of God's grace being sufficient for him. Now, to those who love Charlie, his loss was a terrible tragedy, but Charlie emulated uh, Christ's grace through that entire um, cancer time he went through. So on today's text, we're at the pool of Bethesda, and the story is focused on one man. There's all kinds of sick people there. The Bible says there was a multitude of people there, and yet we're focused on one man. And why is that fair? Or how does that work? I don't know the spiritual dynamic of that. But I do know that God is trustworthy, and God is just, and that we have to trust him. So today we're going to focus on the spiritual aspects of the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed more than the physical aspects. So we'll start off by saying that Jesus saw a man who had said had been disabled for 38 years. He's at the place known for grace and mercy. You see, Bethesda in the Arabic, in the Aramaic, means grace and mercy. But ironically, it can also mean a place of shame and disgrace. So you have several meanings for this word. And here's this man at the place of grace and mercy, wanting a miracle, wanting to be healed, been in that condition for 38 years. Now let's take a brief look at what miracles are. Um, see, here's the thing. Jesus, I got off my place. But Jesus said to the man, do you want to get well? That really struck me. He said to the man, do you want to get well? The man's at the place known for grace and mercy, at the place known for miracles, and Jesus asked one question, do you want to get well? Now my first thought, no disrespect to Jesus, was that seems like kind of a dumb question, doesn't it? Man's been in this condition for 38 years. And then I thought about it more and more, and it seems like really the only question. The only question you can ask, do you want to get well? And so here's the, why this is one of the most unusual miracles in the Bible. Because in almost every other miracle, someone presents a need to Jesus. Either the person who's hurt does, the person who needs healing, someone else comes to Jesus for their son, their daughter, an employee, someone they love, friends bring someone to Jesus. This guy does not call out to Jesus. Sure, he's at the place known for grace and mercy, but this guy does not call out to Jesus. It says, Jesus inquired about him. Jesus learned about him. So what, is, what does the man say when Jesus asks him, do you want to get well? He first says, um, he starts to make excuses. And he says, there's no one to help me. No one to help me. That's his first excuse. His second excuse is, hey, Everyone else gets healed, but I don't. Someone else always beats me to it. Kind of plays a victim card. So what can we learn from this man's answers? He was at the place of miracles, but he wasn't expecting to receive one. He wasn't even asking. He kind of quit trying. He lost hope. I mean, if you think about it, I, I never watched the show Survivor. But people had to survive till the end of the show, right? And they used to form alliances. They used to make partnerships with other people. If you were there for 38 years, wouldn't you have made some kind of an alliance? This is my turn. You guys get me to the water, or better yet, build me some floaties or a raft, and I want to be sitting in the water where the healing takes place. But this guy was living in isolation, dealing with his problem alone. He said, no one to help me. Now, for 38 years, he made a living. We don't know what he did. We don't know how he got back and forth to the place of miracles. We know very little about him. But here's what you can surmise, maybe one of four reasons why he was in the situation he was in where he didn't have anyone to help. Maybe he was too proud to ask for help. Or maybe he was too unpleasant so no one would help him. Maybe he'd become angry and bitter over his situation. Or maybe he felt unworthy over time. 
Maybe he got to the place where he was feeling shame and guilt. Or maybe, and this is what I think it could have been, he was too discouraged. It was safer to just quit and quit trying because he didn't want to get his hopes up again. Now, we don't know why he didn't get help or why he couldn't get help. We only know he'd been disabled for 38 years and he was no longer expecting a miracle. He was alone and isolated. Even at the, he was at the place of miracles. Now consider miracles this morning. What is a miracle? I've heard a lot of people use that word. They sometimes use it if they get a parking spot during Cherry Festival. They sometimes use it if they cook a steak and it turns out just right. Sometimes use it if they get a promotion. They use it for ordinary but improbable things. I think miracle may be the second most misused uh, word in America today. See, a miracle is a supernatural act of God. It's divine providence. That's what a miracle is. Even secular dictionaries say a miracle is divine providence or in intervention. So that's what a miracle is. And you can't do it. It has to be God involved in the mix. But here's a common thing about most miracles, okay? Parting of the Jordan River, what happened? Step of faith into the water before the river's parted. Turning water into wine, Jesus' first message. A miracle, what happened? The servants had to fill the ceremonial cleansing jars with water. Then they had to serve it. They had to take a step of faith, do what Jesus told them to do, and then the water was miraculously turned to wine. The feeding of the 5,000, miraculous, what happened? A little boy had to offer up his lunch of loaves and fishes, and then they had to distribute the food. Again, action. Lazarus dead, right? He's in the grave for three days. He's raised from the dead. What happened? Took human hands to roll away the stones. What about Peter in prison when the church is praying for him? An angel comes in and rescues him. The angel said, you get up, tie your shoes, put on your cloak, do the things you can do. So many people say they want a miracle, but often they're unwilling to do what Jesus said. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. See, most any pastor or counselor will tell you the most frustrating thing about dealing with people is that they're unwilling to act on the truth they know. It's not that people don't know enough, it's that people are not willing to act on what they do know. So today, whether you're tuned in online and you're joining us digitally or whether you're here in person, I'm gonna ask the same question Jesus asked. Do you want to get well? Because that's really the only question. Do you want to get well? You are at the place of grace and mercy. That's what the church is, the place of grace and mercy. But too often we come here with our shame and our guilt and we turn the place of grace and mercy into the place of disgrace for ourselves. Earlier, I told you there was three kinds of sick people that were called out. They were called out, the blind were here, the lame, the paralyzed. Now, a little evaluation about blindness. You can be blind if you're a believer. You can be self-righteous like the Pharisees were, or you can have an improper view of God. But I like to talk about our inability, spiritual blindness, our inability to see a need for a savior as spiritual blindness. See, the Bible says all we, like sheep, have gone astray. In Romans 3.23, it says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 6.23, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So here's a common spiritual blind spots for people who have not decided to give their life to the Lord. Here's the two common things I hear over and over. I'm too good or good enough I don't need a savior. I'm better than most Christians I know. They're all a bunch of hypocrites. Christians make me sick. I've heard it all before. So people feel like God's gonna grade on the curve. They don't need a savior. The other type of spiritual blindness is, I'm too bad. God can't save a person like me. I'm too, I'm too bad. In fact, I've heard people say, if I came to your church, in fact, I have a neighbor that I invite to come to church. He says, if I came to your church, I'd get struck with lightning. 
I'm so bad I'd get hit with lightning if I came to your church. And I was thinking, in 32 years that I've been coming here, no one's ever been hit with lightning when they came here. But then I had to smile when I was doing the message, because you know who did get hit with lightning? The Apostle Paul. Okay, this guy is spiritually blind, right? He's on the road to Damascus. The Bible said he got bright light, knocked off his horse, or if he was walking, knocked to the ground, got welders burned, couldn't see. Metaphorically speaking, the Apostle Paul did get hit with lightning. So if you have people say they're going to get hit with lightning, praise God, they come to church and God opens their eyes. So today, if you don't know the Lord and you're watching online or you're here in person, I want to challenge you just to one thing. Today is the day of your salvation. Just genuinely ask God to prove that he's real to you and to show you that he's God. And you know what? I believe God will honor that prayer and show himself and reveal himself to you. Because just as he went and pursued this man who was not asking for a miracle, he's pursuing you today. Now let's talk about the spiritually lame. Lameness is defined as difficulty in walking due to an injury to your foot or leg. Now, I imagine for those of you online, when you look at me, this is what I imagine or I'd like to believe is you see Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, when I'm up here, and a body of perfection, right? But here's the truth. About a year ago, I hurt my foot in California, and I have a lame right foot, and I have to wear orthotics, and I have difficulty walking, forget about running, and I live on hills, and I work, do fencing on hills, and every time I re-injure my foot. Well, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, verse 12 through 13, strengthen your weak knees and make level paths for your feet so what is lame may be healed and rather than disabled. So for my foot to heal, I need to, do, I need to stay on level ground. Otherwise, I'm going to keep re-injuring it. I can't wear sandals, which bums me out. I'm starting to get discouraged about it. So how do we do that spiritually? Well, Hebrews 12, 1 says, throw off the sin and weight that hinders you and that prevents you from running the race with perseverance. See, too many of us today are trying to run our race when we're lame. Spiritually speaking, we're lame. We carry our sin and addictions with us, our guilt and shame, and we're making us want to quit the race. So how do you make a level path for yourself spiritually? Well, you need to change the terrain. I have a friend in Florida. He describes himself as a recovering alcoholic. If you get to know him, he will tell you the terrible price he's paid for alcohol and how it has affected every aspect of his life, financial, physical, relational, and he will tell you that his struggles to master alcohol. And you know what? He's been to AA, he's done things, but it wasn't until he changed the terrain that he started to have success. You see, all those years he was working as a bartender. When he was trying to beat alcohol, he was working as a bartender. And now, for the last five years, he's changed careers and he's had success, he's been sober for five years. He was willing, finally, to make a change so that he could experience sobriety. And the other thing, he got help. See, the lame man would not get help. Ecclesiastes 4.10 says, isolation kills. It says, two are better than one, because if one is walking and falls down, he doesn't have anyone to help him up. That's the problem with isolation. Isolation is the worst thing if you're trying to deal with a sin, a problem, a lameness. See, I, I believe that one of the reasons so many high-profile pastors have such spectacular failures is for two things. Number one, they're an enhanced target. The enemy is seeking to destroy them. He knows if he can harm the pastor, he can harm the flock. And number two, they don't have anywhere safe to go for help. Think about it. 
their boss, the people they work with, everything, it's their job, it's their career, it's all tied up. They can't find a safe place to go for help. We have a family in our church that understands this. They will provide funds for any pastor or staff member to go get safe help in a confidential place. And I praise God for a family that understands that even pastors can't live and walk in isolation. None of us can. Now my story, this happened to me years ago. I dabbled with sin and it was exciting and it was fun. Until finally one day I woke up and I was no longer controlling my sin, it was controlling me. And I was unable to master it. It was an addiction. I had shame and guilt and isolation. And just like the lame man, when I would come to church, instead of feeling grace and mercy, I would feel shame and guilt and disgrace. Finally, I told God, either I'm gonna quit or I'm gonna get help. And uh, see, sin's best days are the first days. Worst days are the last days. Once sin gets a hold of you, it exacts a terrible penalty, just as my friend talks about. And I went and got help, got out outside of my isolation, and by God's grace, I got my miracle. You see, you have to be willing to get up, pick up your mat, and walk. But the first thing you have to ask yourself is do you want to get well? That's what Jesus asked this guy. Do you want to get well? Now, I don't know what load you're carrying today, whether you're dealing with a financial mess, whether it's a relational mess, whether you're recovering from divorce or relational problems with your children, or whether you have an addictional mess, whether you have an alcoholic or chemical addiction or a sexual addiction or a pornography addiction. This man was 38 years in this condition. He quit trying. While every, he found his way to the place of grace and mercy, just as you did this morning. And Jesus had to go find him and say, do you want to get well? He was hanging on to his shame. Today, if you have an area of shame and disgrace, do you want to get in that well? Now, you probably think, since we're a messes to miracles church, and we've been that way for 26 years, you probably think all the messes sit over there, and all the miracles sit over there. You come in one door as a mess, and you leave as a miracle. I'd like to say that's how it works, but it doesn't work that way. See, Apostle Paul, who we talked about earlier, said he was the chief of sinners. Every seat that has a person in it today has a mess in it, probably. Many of them have a miracle in it as well. So our job is as time goes by, we more and more resemble Christ. We transform more and more to Christ. See, and here's another way that we can help other people transfer from messes to miracles. See, Romans 8, 28 says, God can take whatever mess you have and use it for good. Now, here's how this happened in my life. I grew up in a large family. We had two parents at the time, nine children, five girls and four boys. We had a three-bedroom house and a one-bathroom house. So we have five boys in one bedroom, four girls in the other. Oldest brother got a bed by himself. This wasn't a very big house. And then four of us boys laid in bed crosswise. And we went to bed with four boys in the same bed lying crosswise. And I had an area of shame and guilt because I was a ferocious bedwetter, okay? And I used to wet the bed as a child and then wake up in the middle of the night wet and cold and then they go crawl in bed with one of my sisters and wet their bed, okay? And that was something that, as a young child, really bothered me. And we had a large family. My parents but both came from large families. We had large family reunions. And one time I was at a family reunion, maybe 60 or 70 people there. One of my no-good brothers started to tease me about being a bedwetter in front of all those people. And I was feeling shame, embarrassment, and I was isolated. And then my Uncle Harold, we called him Uncle Curly, 
came up to me, said, let's take a walk, Rob. He was one of two people that called me Rob, him and my mom. You see, here's the deal. Uncle Curly was successful. He was big and strong. He was a scratch golfer. He used to buy us gifts at Christmas because my father was killed when, he, when I was only nine. I looked up to him, loved him, put his arm around me, said, let's go for a walk. He said, listen, I was a bedwetter too. And you know what? It's going to get better. He said, it's going to get better. He gave me hope. He gave me understanding. He told me he used to wet his bed too. He was right. I hardly ever wet my bed anymore. <laughs> but here's the thing. So many of you have stories of messes you've overcovered. You've overcome. You can be Uncle Curly in someone else's life. You can walk with them. Many of you are already doing that. You're already in areas of care groups where you are using your past pains, your past hurts, your past disgraces, where you've experienced a miracle and you're walking with others. And I want to encourage you today, if you're in the middle of a mess, there's somebody at New Hope who's been in that mess before. Somebody at New Hope who's willing to walk with you, put their arm around you, and tell you it's going to get better. That's what Messes to Miracles is. People here have experienced whatever you're experiencing. They want to help, and they're willing to walk with you. And I'm here to testify it will get better. Now, the third, third area we talked about is paralysis. I thought of it spiritually. What's the three things that cause spiritual paralysis? My list may not be complete, but the first one I came up with is unforgiveness. Paralysis is the inability to move, okay? That's what it's defined as. Second one is bitterness. Third area may be grief, okay? So, what's the cure for unforgiveness? It's forgiving. It's following Christ's example. And, you know, forgiving people is really hard. You know why? It's so unfair. It's so foreign. It's so hard. They may not even ask for it just as this man was past the point of asking. But here's the thing about forgiveness. It's so necessary. It's so commanding, commanded, and it's so rewarding, and it gives you freedom of movement again. If you're holding on to a grudge, let me just tell you this this morning. There are no enduring relationships without forgiveness. Unforgiveness kills your relationships, and it kills your relationships with your heavenly Father. He not only commands you to forgive, he wants you to forgive because he wants you to experience abundant life. So let me ask you this morning, are you willing to get up, pick up your mat and walk and forgive those people or that person who doesn't deserve it? Are you willing to do that this morning? Do you want to be well? Someone said bitterness is like drinking poison and expecting someone else to get sick or die from it. See, I think this man, this, this lame man or disabled man was filled with bitterness. I think that's one of the reasons he couldn't find anybody to help him because he was so off-putting to everyone that only Jesus would reach out to him anymore. See, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. That is the opposite of bitterness. So as you spend time in God's Word and you forgive God can change you just like he changed Naomi to where you can start describing yourself as joyful. Finally, grief can bring paralysis. And I'm not, I know grief is a necessary process. I called Pastor Tim about this. He said if you don't deal with grief, it will lead to anger or addiction almost every time. And I will say there's a proverb that says, not in our Bible, but there's a proverb that says, grief shared is halved, and grief and joy shared is multiplied. So if you have grief today, I encourage you to get with some people you trust, safe people, whether a grief share group that we do offer here or others, and work through your grief. Now, I'd like to close the message right now, and I really wanted to, but that's not where the passage stops, okay? This, I told you this is a very unusual miracle, maybe the most unusual, 
Because for the second time in this story, in the same day, Jesus goes and finds the guy again. He finds the guy who's had the miracle. The guy's in the right place, he's in the temple, probably praising God that after 38 years he's been healed. But here's what Jesus says in verse 14 that should come to every Christ follower here, should come right into your heart as a severe warning. Jesus said, see now you are well again, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. See, we don't have time to fully explore that this morning. All of us to our Christ followers have received the miracle of salvation. You were dead and now you're alive. Don't take your miracle for granted. Your miracle of salvation or whatever else you've seen should result in life change. See, a stern warning in Hebrews 10.26, it says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left for us, but only a fearful expectation of judgment. So several points. If you're a child of God, if you've experienced the miracle of salvation, you are the light of the world. You are salt and light. Don't cheapen Christ's sacrifice by continuing to sin and forgetting your healing. We're gonna have some music now. I just want to remind you, that's what the Israelites did. The Israelites saw miracle upon miracle upon miracle. They were set free from bondage, and they kept wandering into four sins. One was materialism, idolatry. The second one was sexual immorality. They tested God because they continued to put him to the test on things. And then finally, they were grumblers. They weren't thankful. You can find that in 1 Corinthians. So if you've received a miracle, be grateful, quit sinning, don't take Christ's grace for granted. So I'm going to ask you this morning, do you want to get well? Do you want to experience a miracle? Are you willing to do your part in the miracle process by getting up, picking up your mat, and walking? We're going to sing a song right now called, Your Goodness is Running After Me, okay? And here's what, here's what the song says. I want you to think about this, whether you're online, I'm asking you to stay with us through the song, or whether you're here in person, I want you to worshipfully consider this as you sing these words. It's gonna say, with my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. See, your, his goodness is running after you. Just as Jesus came after this man twice, this man who was so discouraged, he was past the point of asking, so burdened, Jesus came after him. Get out of your isolation. Here's what I'm asking you to do today. I'm asking you to ask God prayerfully during this song what it is that you need to do to get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Maybe that's forgive. Maybe that's something else for you. Maybe that's get into a financial peace course. Maybe that's get into a divorce care course. Maybe that's something else. But I, for me, I had to reach out and I need to get somebody to come alongside me. I needed to bring them my sin, a safe place, so I could experience a miracle. And you know what? I did, and I'm free. And I don't ever want to go back. If you're weighed down, with guilt, if you're not experiencing grace and mercy today, you're at the place of grace and mercy. If you're weighed down with sin, guilt, and disgrace, it's because you're not asking for a miracle and standing up, picking up your mat, and walking, and doing the bare minimum so the Lord can do the rest. I pray God today that you will do your part and stand up, pick up your mat, and walk and let God do the rest. He is the miracle giver. Pastor Rick will dismiss us. God bless you. Well, a huge shout out to you and our online family. We see you out there and we rejoice in the many testimonies that come my way of how God is actively at work in your lives. I'm Craig Trueweiler, your pastor, reminding you, you are loved.